the Hudson Library and Historical Society's Adult Program Series. An Evening with Terry Pluto and Amanda Rabinowitz, a Northeast Ohio sports conversation. Featuring Cleveland Plain Dealer sports and faith writer Terry Pluto, a member of the Cleveland Journalism Hall of Fame and the author of 23 books. And Amanda Robinowitz, Assistant News Director and host of Morning Edition, heard every weekday on 89.7 WKSU NPR Radio and winner of the Ohio Associated Press Broadcasters Award for the best reporter in the state. Presented by WKSU, Feed Your Curiosity 89.7. Co-presented by the Hudson Library and Historical Society and Hudson's own Learned Owl Bookshop. And Dave Walter BMW and Dave Walter Volkswagen of Akron. Recorded at the Hudson Library's Flood Meeting Room on September 30th, 2015. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks for coming out tonight. I'm WKSU News Director and Hudson resident, Andrew Meyer. It's great to be with you tonight. Welcome to an evening with Terry Pluto and Amanda Rabinowitz, the Northeast Ohio Sports Conversation. Tonight promises to be a lovely, a lovely and lively discussion about sports in Northeast Ohio. And I think everyone agrees, Cleveland sports fans are some of the most loyal, they have to be, and passionate fans in the country. I want to thank Polly Reynolds and Marilyn Stanko here at the library, and everyone at the library, for being great event partners. Thanks to Kate from the Learned Owl, who is here tonight with a selection of Terry's books for sale. You'll be able to learn more about that after the conversation. And I also want to thank Dave Walter BMW and Dave Walter Volkswagen for being our event sponsors this evening. Tonight's event is a live version of the conversations that you get to tune into every Wednesday morning on 89.7 WKSU between Terry and Amanda. Let me tell you a little bit about these two. Amanda Rabinowitz is WKSU's local host of NPR's Morning Edition and an award-winning reporter who's won a National Murrow Award from the Radio, Television, Digital News Directors She's twice been named Best Anchor in Ohio by the Ohio Associated Press Media Editors. Terry Pluto is perhaps Northeast Ohio's most recognized sports columnist through his writing for formerly the Akron Beacon Journal and currently the Plain Dealer. He's twice been honored by the Associated Press Sports Editors as one of the nation's top sports columnists. He's a nine-time winner of the Ohio Sports Writer of the Year Award and has been inducted into the Cleveland Journalism Hall of Fame. He's the author of a count of 23 books. Where do you have the time? I'm old. <laughs> His latest is Glory Days in Tribe Town, the Cleveland Indians, in Jacobs Field, 1994 to 1997. After we hear from Amanda and Terry, there will be plenty of time for your questions. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Terry Pluto and Amanda O'Donnell. So they've had, the six years they've had four coaches, basically four general managers. How many quarterbacks have they had? Oh. <laughs> what, like four years? <laughs> it actually matters three. So if nothing else, okay. we have longevity. We've outlasted a whole bunch of people for the Browns. Unfortunately, how it works with the Browns is 
And this is something, we do have a few chairs here and there. We could like play ushers and point to them, one over here and one over there. Uh, but uh, one of the things there is that uh, by lasting that long, you think about how it's really bad when you can't think of the coach from 2013. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it really is. And for a while, the Cavs were having a couple of coaches, although Mike Brown was a good answer because he came back a couple of times. He was coaching the Cavs. Well, Mike Brown used to when he's back, but he's gone now. So, but uh, I'm going to start a little bit, you know, we mentioned the, the, the commentaries of Amanda and I have been doing for six years. Amanda, in fact, you know what I'm going to do? See, these are things when you're old, you like, you need your, sometimes when I was real young, Younger, I have like index cards like this big, but as you get older, you don't see so well. You need sort of bigger ones to see. What is life like at 2:30 a.m.? Why would I ask you that? Amanda? Well, I get up at 2:30 a.m. every day to come to WKSU and host morning edition. So my alarm goes off at 2:30. I get to the station by four, and at 4 a.m. is when it actually really kicks into gear because I start preparing um, all the newscasts for the day. So my job is to figure out what happened while everybody was sleeping. And um, to be ready to go, show starts at 5.06 to be exact, and I'm live on the air, and I'm with my coffee, and ready to give the news, and everything everybody needs to know to get their day started, so. You know, the thing about crazy. Amanda is she'll sometimes, like, wake up about 12.30 in the night, and she'll just start spotting off all those stations that WKSU is on. <laughs> right, right. I always say, what was the one that... Uh, I was Thompson. 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 You know, I, we had to look in the map to see where it is. And then the great thing is actually with KSU, the reach of that station. <coughs> Well, how many, seriously, how many stations? Well, we, um, how many repeat? I, I see them every day, but we cover 22 counties. Yeah. Five? Five. Five. Okay, five. I was going to say six, so. And, I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of a, a neat thing, too. But, Amanda, so think about this. Well, first of all, she gets up 2.30 in the morning. Now, the bad thing about being under 2.30 in the morning is you're running into some people who are coming in at 2.30 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, right. Someone used to play for the Browns, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but anyway, but Amanda, how, I always wonder too, like this music that's behind like the different things, do you, how, do you pick that or where do you get that? Yeah, pretty much. Like, pretty much. like from where? Wherever I can find it. You mean you're not like playing a piano there? No, 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 it's, no, no, I have to pick that up. What do you, what do you, sir, sir, you said like you love this job, so you keep standing up on this. Okay. <laughs> This is really great when you're older, you can just say anything you want. <laughs> uh, what, why do you like the job? Why do I like Posty Morning Edition? Mm -hmm. You're telling them. Well, um, it's, it's just such a great feeling to be the person that when people wake up in the morning, you want to know what's going on in the world. And, you know, a lot of people are in, it's a busy world, you have a lot of choices out there. When you land on WKSU, you're getting ready, you have your coffee. It's just, you can relax and sit back and get all the things that you need to get done in the morning and I'll be there to let you know what you need to know and get your day going and maybe you start listening to the house and then you carry it over to the car and then hopefully when you pull into work or wherever you're going, you're going, I just can't turn this off. That's what what gets me going every day is the fact that, you know, we're there for you. And I love being there live at 5 a.m. and knowing that that's something to count on every single day. They want us on the stage. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, right. that's, why, that's why you need people to tell you what to do, which is why I need Amanda. See, because when we do these commentaries, mm -hmm. which if they do sound decently, it's because she has taken 22 minutes of battle and turned it into you know, something that is reasonably mm -hmm. coherent on a thing. But I remember when, because I had no clue on who I was going to be matched up with or whatever. But, there's like ML Schulze was the person who was like kind of the news director back then, and she's asked me if I wanted to do this, and I thought, well, it'd be kind of cool to do something on, on NPR, or something different. And um, then suddenly, like Amanda shows up, I'd never met her or anything, and I'm sitting there going, oh boy, they stuck me with a woman. <laughs> <laughs> bad. I mean, I know it's bad because actually, some really good uh, broadcasters and sports writers are women. In fact, it's one of the things that. Um, we talked about, but she was not a sports person. You know, this is not somebody who was that I like Mary Kay Cabot that I see covering the Browns, or uh, for a long time Mary Schmidt Boyer covering the Cavaliers. You know, people that I've known for many decades. I didn't know Amanda from anybody else, and so I was really hoping 
you know, one of Joe Tate's big lines always says, that guy doesn't know whether the ball is blown up or stuffed. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy, I wonder which is it going to be. And I was surprised. That, Amanda, how did you get to be a sports fan? Uh, well, it started when I was a kid. It was uh, something my, with my dad and I. And um, We started out as Mets fans. Um, grew up in New Jersey, so grew up following the Mets, and I'm glad they're in the playoffs this year after some bad years again. So I'm excited about that, but I'm actually an Indians fan now. But I grew up a Mets fan, and so my dad had this tradition that he would buy tickets to three games at the old Shea Stadium every year. And so it was just, the, I would like circle it on my calendar. It was like every year, summer would come, and it would be like, when's our next game? And so we would go to the game. I'd bring my glove, and you know, we'd talk about Dale Strawberries in the field then. And, um, I just used my favorite player. I had his baseball card. I was like, Dad, maybe I'll catch a fly ball or you know, a foul ball. And so that's how my love for sports grew. It was a bond between my father and I. And that's kind of how it was for you, right? But Amanda, right. hold on a second. This is going to make a, this will make a point. Okay. Really well, unlike other things. I'm trying. Well, how old were you the last time you went to a game with your dad? I would say 11 or 12. Yeah, because he died when you were how old? He uh, died when I was 14 of cancer. All right. Think about that. 11 or 12, we won't say how old Amanda is, but she's older than 11 or 12. And here she is thinking about when her dad took her to the game, circling it on the calendar and so on. That is the whole, now it could be a Browns thing or whatever, but that's kind of how it works. And that's why sometimes we need to remember, like when we're taking, whether we're grandparents or uncles or whatever, you take the kids to the game. I remember. Couple, it was earlier, I forgot whether it was this year or last year, is, but I'm walking through the stands, and this guy is at Progressive Field, and this guy's just going, the Dolans are cheap, and this guy's awful, and, just, and he's there with two little kids, and he can almost like see them shrinking down in their seats. His dad is so mad. And I actually did keep my mouth shut, maybe I shouldn't have, but I'm thinking, Dad, you're not there to do really bad sports talk. You're there with the kids. And my guess, Dad, is when you went to India's games, because I looked at him, unless you hit kind of the glory era, that little thing in the, from like 94 to 2001. <laughs> By the way, how can it, I don't even know how to cope with an Indian fan who grew up with that, those teams. You know, the rest of us, right, the teams are terrible. They don't tell me they were good. They weren't good in the 60s, they weren't good in the 70s, they weren't good in the 80s, and they weren't good in 91, 92, or 93. So please. Don't tell me you know you grew up with all this great baseball, just like actually the, the couple mess teams you had that were pretty good. They were, yeah. Um, but then she came here. Actually, when did you come to when did you come to uh, here? I came here in ninety-five. Ninety-five. So there and then so she 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 just came like she thought they were gonna be good all the time. <laughs> yeah, that's right, I did, I did. That's probably why I converted <laughs> Yeah, you converted and look what happened. You know, it became 2002. Yeah. Um, and so, but one of the things we try to do when we're uh, doing our commentaries or whatever is, uh oh, Amanda. Mm -hmm. Your next, your next, next, next one. Here we go. Stop yelling now. <laughs> yeah. And this is one of the things that I have to admit is kind of one of my pet peeves about sports or whatever. And Amanda. You were saying the politics the same way. Let's get three or four people up there and see how loud they could yell over each other. And that doesn't mean everything has to be reasoned and long, but uh, I do think that, like when we're doing sports, first of all, sports and life, like that one over there, I have a uh, message. You know, sports actually is not life. It's really not life. I mean, I've had people, in fact, in fact, one day Tom Hamilton was very tired, and a guy said to him, my co-author Tom, said, if, you know, if the Indians would finally win a World Series, well, then I could die. <laughs> and he came and said, I said, well, what if they don't? <laughs> it's kind of like one of those, the dog chasing the car. If he ever caught the SUV, what would he do with it? <laughs> Actually, probably some of us might have a coronary if one of the teams won a championship. But the idea to me is sports is a diversion from life. Sports is 
like when you're dealing with cancer. But man, LeBron's going to be on tonight. I want to watch that. Or like right now, Nancy, who's oh man, does wave, wave your hand, Nancy. Wave your hand. There we go. Up in the air. That's Amanda's mom right there. And she is, you talk about somebody who deserves a hand. She's been battling with stroke for two years. She's been doing great. Give her a hand right now. But I know one of the things you guys like to do is watch some of the games on TV. We do. We, do. we love sports. We watch those Browns every Sunday. We're also big tennis fans, so we watch all the tennis tournaments. The U.S. Open, we just finished watching that together. We love it. We love it. Because it takes us into somewhere where it's just not life all the time. When we had a lot of troops over in Iraq, they used to go to this place in uh, Kuwait, it seemed like, uh, the Ohio guys. You know, I get these emails, and they would say, well, you know, you knew it. This, this is like when it was really hot, 2005, 2006, 2007. And you know it was bad, and they're like, will the Browns ever get a quarterback? <laughs> <laughs> will the Indians ever spend any money? You know, all these type of things. And I realized in the same way when, when, I, when I was helping to take care of my dad and he had his stroke, that sports was a great diversion. Mm -hmm. And, we, you know, we could yell about it and that, but in effect, that's what it is. I remember when LeBron left the first time, I got some emails, and people were acting like this is the worst thing that ever could have happened. And I seriously, I started answering them, if this is the worst thing that happens to you this month, sign up for it. <laughs> right. right? I mean, look, and, and I'm glad LeBron's back. It's a lot more fun. But sports, when it's, I'd rather have them win than lose than that. But I just can't act like, um, all right, yeah. here they are. We're going to do a little bit of... Fan therapy. Okay, All let's right. do it. These, these emails came in in the last three days. The, really? To me. Three days. Three days. Three days. Okay. The Oakland loss kind of pushed a few people over the edge. You ready? Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's see. These um, are, 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 are cautiously edited, I may add. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah, some things are scratched out, so we'll, we'll keep it. Uh, Alan says, fooled again by my own delusions of hope. <laughs> There's one. I actually, uh, I hope. None of you were in the room that sent that email to me with the big capital letters. The heading said, you're delusional. I forgot what I was delusional about, but it made me really want to read it. Uh, all right, go ahead. So that was... Uh, okay, so fooled again. Fooled again. Go ahead. Uh, let's see. Paul says, I'm confused. Why am I a Browns fan? Why do I care anymore? <laughs> sort of like the eternal questions. In fact, I can imagine. What's his name? What's his name? The guy. Who? Oh, Paul. 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 Yeah. I can imagine Paul sitting there. What did he say? <laughs> he said, he said why, why am I a Browns fan? Why do I care anymore? Why am I a Browns fan? <laughs> why do I care anymore? I'm getting no answers from this guy here. <laughs> Didn't you play quarterback like in 2003? <laughs> I'm pretty sure he did, yeah. He did, yeah. He did, he did. He, did. he goes, that was not a good offensive line back then. I took a pounding. All right, sit over here, be good. Okay, what right. else we got? All right, we got, um, okay, this one has some scratches in it. So <laughs> maybe the Pope can stop by and do an exorcism and clean out a few demons. Demons are the problem, and I thought it was the draft. Maybe the Pope can help. Okay. <laughs> yes, the Pope, right? It's just... <laughs> yeah, and the Pope thought, you know, going in that prison in Philadelphia was rough. Let's send him over to Berea and see, see if he can get some work done there at the right, training camp. Right. Okay. Here okay, here's another one from Mark. I don't know how much more of this I can take. <laughs> I'm close to calling it quits. It's extremely painful to have to watch these performances each week and know there's no hope for the future. Yesterday's loss was a nauseating reminder of how this inept organization operates year after year. Sure does sound like another 4-12 and 12 season with coaching and GM changes at the end of the year. It sickens my stomach to have to write this, but it is the truth. <laughs> that heading came in, I'm nauseated. <laughs> I wrote back, you never should let the millionaires ruin your day or ruin your supper. You know, but it is, it is funny how that, uh, it's almost like, I know we have one more here, but okay. here's the fan therapy thing over here. But do you like how high tech we are, by the way? You know, you like this? Keeping it, it simple. It is impressive. Roberta wrote those out. We got these at the dollar store. Um, so <laughs> this comes from doing jail ministry all these years. You can't exactly go in there with a lot of, you know, rough things. So it, th those are always nice to have. 
a lot of times the, the emails I get to, it's like, like the one guy, so I've been a Browns fan for 30 years, and they can tend to go on and on. My dad took me to the first game when Jim Donowski was the backup quarterback, and we ate. It goes, you know, you really think after a while you're like in a, uh, uh, a AA meeting or a celebrate recovery meeting. <laughs> My name is Terry. I am a Browns fan. <laughs> Only a higher power can help me. <laughs> or it could be, I, my name is Terry, I'm an Indians fan. <laughs> Only a higher power can help yeah, I me. Mean, take your pick. I mean, you just go on and on. A number of years ago, ESPN, and they came back, they came back, well, they had a general survey about five to eight years ago on which sports city was the most miserable. <laughs> and many, Lots of research or whatever they came out with Cleveland just edging out Philadelphia. Well, I was incredulous about this. What do you mean just edging out Philadelphia? <laughs> They're a lot more miserable than Philadelphia. They're not even close. Look, this is our next quarterback. I mean, come on. <laughs> Give me that. Edging out Philadelphia. I mean, you know. Philadelphia, you guys got, you even got a hockey team. They want some stuff. I mean, come on, don't give me that. And then, you know, so this past year, they did a, like, which fan base of the NFL has suffered the most? Mm -hmm, now, mm -hmm. any, like, one guess is allowed? Because <laughs> I, I, you know, obviously the Browns came in first and, like, there was 31 teams tied for second. So, you know, <laughs> what, what, what you had there was, uh, I thought, it's a classic thing of, I don't know if these franchises, and especially, especially holds true for the Browns, truly appreciates the fan support they have because the team moved, <laughs> moved. And I wrote this book called False Start, and my editor keeps wanting me to write False Start number two <laughs> or number three, which highlighted the move and how the NFL really messed them over until they came back. And so I look at that. And that's why when you listen to these, these letters, these people are in pain. <laughs> they really are. Mm -hmm. And they keep coming back. So they keep, so usually I get the letter. It starts with kind of the, you know, I'm in rehab. My name is Terry. I've been a Browns fan since here. I remember the 64 championship game, listening to it in my basement, which I did, because the wonderful Art Modell, by the way, had the choice of blacking out the 64 title game or not, or showing it. <laughs> he blacked it out. Oh. But that's what, so all, but it, you know, you wonder, like, was he getting like a kickback from these hotels in like Erie and Columbus? Because they were advertising the paper. I wrote about this in the book on the 64 Browns. I, by the way, I almost died at the end of that book. It's the only sports book I ever wrote that had a happy ending about Cleveland sports. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but they were, you know, they were advertising the paper to, you know, come to the, these hotel rooms you know, out of the 90 mile radius to, to do that. So people would tell, like, where they, where they saw the game or whatever. I didn't bring in a man that came in right before here. A guy just sent me a retrospective on Red Right 88 from 1980. <laughs> How really it wasn't that bad of a call. And that was the game, the big snow game, where the, the Browns lost to Oakland and Brian Sipe threw a pass when they should have run it. And he went on, interception. It was like, we all know these things. And it's, it goes on, even if you weren't alive, you know these things, you've heard these things. <laughs> it's like these strange relatives you have, they just pop up, you know, and they come back with their miserable stories. So, uh, I'm going, this man is writing about Red Ride 88, 35 years later. He can't get over it. He's not doing well. All right, who's our last person? All right, our here? last person here. All the way from California. Some people write to you from California. Browns fans from California right I now. I would say sorry, about a good third of the emails come from out of state. Wow. That's amazing. So he uh, concludes, this gentleman, by saying, now we're stuck with a team of four different visions from four different regimes, and if this year goes badly, we'll have to start over again with number five, and it's signed, Go Cavs. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, now, because you're relatively new, you're like 95. Right. You know, that's the other thing I love about sort of Northeast Ohio is generally most people have been here a long time. Their families have been here a long time. It's mm -hmm. ingrained. Um, right. Like when I was out 
I spent a fair amount of time uh, in the Oakland area because the Cavs were playing Oakland, and I was talking to all these people, and just about all of them were from somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, originally. And so, you know, they've spent a lifetime following the Warriors, at least since Stephon Curry came to the team. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like five years or whatever. That's a lifetime right, out right. there. Now, you, when you came in, like in 95, now you saw these fans. What do you make of the fans here? They are just really devoted. <laughs> devoted, devoted, devoted. Year after year after year of just devotion and letdown and heartbreak. Kind of like being a Mets fan, though, a little yeah, bit. But, but do, do you like, do you think they like to suffer? Yes. <laughs> Every year we know we're going to go through it again, but we just keep coming back. We keep coming back. And, and I think, now, the reason we're doing this is some of the things we, we talk about. And we, it's one of those, like, we want the stuff on NPR that we do to be a little different. You know, we don't want to. I always like people to just stop the yelling now and they start yelling, you know. It's like, will you just calm down? <laughs> I always like that person. Please, you know. That always works, by the way. Uh, and so, you know, and so that's why I, we are trying to give you a little fan, fan therapy tonight. And it's it kind of that. We sort of brought these people here. So do you feel like a therapist when you write all the ready back? Once in a while, I do. You know, it's like I, therapists because of the faith count sometimes. Like, I hope the person in here isn't the one who wrote the email to me that said, uh, I heard you pastor a church like in Northeast Ohio. We're moving up from Columbus. And we would kind of like, what church do you kind of speak at, whatever, because we wanted to come. So I wrote, well, if you're in Summit County, you get arrested. <laughs> Make sure when you're assigned at the county jail, you ask to be, back then it was pod four, now it's pod two, section like of the jail. We're there every Wednesday morning at 930. Just come on out. Make sure you hit the sign-up sheet. Uh, <laughs> we were just there this morning. My wife, my wife, Roberta, here she is. Wave her hand. See, now, if, there we go. She made all the high-tech signs, so they're, you know, that's really great. But that, and but the thing I always say, if we've been married 38 years, but she's 31. <laughs> guys, I got. I'm going to help you guys right now. Some of you guys, right? All right, 38 years, but she's 31. Got that? That's that's the wise math, okay? <laughs> then another thing, 80% of all cards are bought by women. What does that tell us, men, about women in cards? I know, we're all sitting there, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> they like cards. Thank you, sister. Right, my sister right there. And if we actually write something nice in the card besides an X for our name or whatever, it even is better. And when we mess up, a card that admits we messed up might actually get us over, you know? So just a little advice. Now, other part of advice. This is going to help you ladies. Okay. You ready? Yeah, sure. Never say to a guy, you always do this or you never do that. For example, you always leave the dishes over here and you don't put them away. The guy will say, that's not true. Well, you always do it. October 12, 2008, <laughs> I, I put them away that day. So if I could ever say something about where never actually works, Never say always, because we'll come back with the exception. All right, best advice I can give. I mean, you know, <laughs> you ask like, what do I do? That's what I do, along with you know, these other things. So, right. you know, we have that, and, and uh, you know, sports and life, we've actually been dealing a little bit with it. These guns are making me very nervous. <laughs> I asked Polly over here, she said the last speaker they assigned the people to have guns, but they were bad shots. They missed them. <laughs> they had to fill in some things back in the wall there, but that's okay, you know. So it's, uh, I mean, they look really cool. I just hope they stay in that case. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, when you, were, I mean, you were born and raised a sports fan with your mm -hmm. dad, right? And so, how do you? I mean, are, do you identify with the rest of the fan base here personally of just going through all of this with these teams year, year after year? I mean, my dad. Uh, Grew up in the east side of Cleveland, and then I lived in Parma, and then I lived in Northfield, 
Uh, and then after Roberta and I got married, we lived in Brecksville for a little while, Newburgh Heights, and, and now we live in, in West Akron. So uh, now when I was uh, coming right out of Cleveland State, I worked in Greensboro, Savannah, and Baltimore. And I'll tell you, one of the advantages of, I did that with the idea, I want to come back and work in this market, work in Northeast Ohio, because um, when I was writing, for example, in Greensboro, my first year there, I was assigned to cover the ACC tournament. And my friends, like I have a friend named Bob Bevan, who's a Wake Forest guy, I love Wake Forest. Other of my friends on the staff there, they were Duke guys or North Carolina guys. And they had all the stories about Tobacco Road and old time basketball and everything there, just like we have, say, with the Browns or whatever. I found it interesting, but it, there was no real connection, okay? It was just, it was writing a nice story. Mm -hmm. and even when I covered the Orioles in 1979 as a baseball writer in Baltimore, I really enjoyed it. I covered Earl Weaver. Um, Earl Weaver, for the longest time, had the record for the most ejections in a game. <laughs> and I learned a ton of baseball from Earl Weaver. I also learned how to put certain unspeakable words together in combinations I had never heard before. <laughs> it was remarkable how he would just kind of throw them all together. Um, but, you know, Earl Weaver invented the statistics. When you say, like, uh, Francisco Lindor, like the Indians are playing the Twins today, They're, and they said, like, Francisco Lindor was batting 500 against this kid pitching for the Twins, Kyle Gibson. Earl Weaver invented that. And think of the competitive advantage. It's almost like the same person in radio decided to sell commercials or something. I mean, it's like it was a breakthrough. And he had them on little index cards that he had these people doing. So I'm, I'm watching this. And Earl never made it a secret. He would show us writers, this is why I make up my lineup, and here's the cards. So I remember I came to the Indians in 1980 to cover the, point, to cover the Indians for the Point Dealer. And a very nice man named Dave Garcia is the manager. And uh, I said, Dave, do you ever do any stats like hitters against pitchers? No, nah, no, no, we don't, we don't do that. So how do you make up the lineup? Because I kind of think if I go, well, I think that kid will get a hit today. <laughs> and I suddenly realized I went from baseball graduate school to kindergarten. So I said, well, well Dave, this is what Earl Weaver does. It's, it's a huge advantage. You know, now it's just a given. Everybody does it. And it just didn't register. I mean, the interesting thing is I wrote about this in the book on uh, Tom Hamilton and I, Glory Days, on the Indians of the 90s. The general manager for that team was Hank Peters the Oriole team in 1979, the same Hank Peters who was brought in here by Dick Jacobs to kind of get the Indian squared away. It was good. Um, even in 2007, you know, getting to the game wasn't a problem, and, you know, they were good that year. And also, Amanda, just curious, were you one of those Mets fans that just hated the Yankees? Did you hate the Yankees, Amanda? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I mean, I don't think like about Amanda. Just about everybody else I know from New York is a Yankee fan. That's right. I if you suffered. want to be a Met fan, fine. You like to suffer too. You're, you're alive. <laughs> right. That's you know? why I understood. I understood. I mean, all of a sudden, they've come out of nowhere this year. There's hope for any of us. Right. <laughs> well, Amanda, uh, you, by the way, what did you, you when you've gone to games, because she goes to games now on yeah. that, do you like going to games at Progressive Field? I or love what, going to what games. What about it? Tell us about what you like. I like watching the game. <laughs> so when I go to games, I'm paying attention to what's happening. I'm following along. I'm I've seen cheering. you send pictures on your phone. Okay, no. a little social media. <laughs> that's, okay. that's okay. That's okay. It is okay. That's, did you, have you gone down the corner area, that thing? I have not been there. Yeah. No. I, you know, I wondered about that, and I went down there. In fact, it was the night the Indians are struggling so much to score that a guy for Kansas City hit a home run, and the guy, they let out the fireworks anyway. Remember oh, that yeah. was a couple weeks ago? <laughs> Josh Tomlin is on the mound, you know, knowing I'm never going to get any runs, and now they're celebrating the other team, <laughs> team's runs. But I, it was a night that was like, you know, 12,000 or whatever, small circle of friends. But I'll tell you, I went down there, there were a lot of people there. Half of them were looking at their phone, but they were down there. <laughs> and I think, I don't have a big explanation for why the Indians don't draw any better. You can go along, you know, that whole thing. In general, though, um, this is a football town. I was speaking to one of the people who came and said, think about if the last three years of the Indians were the Browns, in 2013 they would have been 9-7 and seven and made the playoffs and lost in the first round. 
In 2008, they would have been 9-7 and seven and didn't make the playoffs. And this year, they would have been 8-8. Eight eight. Um, the Browns going to be 8-8? Eight eight? <laughs> I don't think so. No? No, I don't no, think so. No. so <laughs> Do you? No. Okay. No, I'm hoping for, <laughs> hoping for better. By the way, you know what? They haven't asked a question I thought would come out really early. Yeah, I'm surprised. Why don't you just go ahead and ask it? Good. All right. Johnny Manziel, should he start or not? I, I wonder. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Johnny Manziel, should he start? By the way, I don't know. I, this is where I turn into a really old grump. You know, this quote, TMZ story. So I went to look it up. I understand, and at different times you use unnamed sources, but there's, there's no name on the byline. My thing is always like, look, you can write a story saying that these people are unhappy with that. Have guts enough to put your name on the story, at least. Mm -hmm. You know. So I said, by TMZ, three starters are mad because Johnny Manziel starting instead of McCollin. I'm sure after the game they probably were because you'd always rather blame the coach for losing than yourself. That's kind of one of the things you do. Um, I've, been, I've been all over the map and after Johnny actually played a decent game, whether to play him or not. I, I really waffled and wimped out and couldn't figure out what I wanted. And, Probably I would just play him to see. I don't have a lot of confidence it would work, but um, you know, I'm not saying Josh McCollin's old, but he and I both remember when they played football without a face mask. So, <laughs> and I like McCollin, but he's 36, and and so, but there. So, how about that? There was no Johnny question. I'm surprised. All right. I'm surprised you even answered it. Not well. Yeah. <laughs> she'll, she'll go through all that now. If she was editing this, it would sound a lot better. <laughs> all right, one or two more, and then that, that's it. What do you, what do you, there we go. Do you think the Indians have a, an exit strategy for Chief Wahoo? And if so, what is it? And if not, um... With Paul Dolan, I don't think so. I mean, I think they'll continue to offer. Well, Amanda and I used to go around on this, their hat. What was the hat? The hat. The block C hat. The red hat. Yeah, the red hat. Yeah. The blue C. I tell you, that's one of the declines of civilization right there, was that red hat with the blue C. I just could not stand that I had that one. What? I know you had one. <laughs> All my friends were buying them just to annoy me. And then, on top of it, I found out that year they introduced it, 2011 or 12, it was the second best-selling hat. Actually, the Chief Wahoo stuff <clears throat> sells, but not at the high level of the different things that... Um, they come out with. I think their best-selling uh, jersey this year, not of a player's, but was of uh, It was the road gray world thing. They said Cleveland over here. Uh, I, Paul Dolan would not get rid of it, but they're not going to accent it. I think they're somewhere there. I wrote a thing a number of years ago that I would hire four top American, uh, uh, you would say, they, they say Native American, but frankly, Roberta and I have been out west a lot, and when we were in the reservation, wherever they call it, the biggest name, the biggest paper out there is called Indian Country Today. So that is not viewed as there. So, why well, right, Native American or, or whatever, Indian artists, the three or four of them, have them do a drawing that they would like and have the fans vote on it and see what you come up with. You know, what would you think Chief Wahoo should look like? I'd be curious to see. Um, I've said that to Paul Dolan, and uh, basically it was sort of like talking to... <laughs> he was very nice and said, that's very interesting. And so that's for that why, why keep it? Why do you think Dolan wants to keep it? I think because he grew up with it, and there, and then, you know, there's always the argument, you know, is it, is it that offensive, or is it just a, a kind of a political cause for something else? Um, my thing was I would like to say, first of all, that's why the name Indians, the people that want to get rid of that, it's just, I mean, I'm serious, it's published out of Rapid City. Indian country today, for a long time, was funded by USA Today. That's what they called it. So in that regard, you know, that's not a, a negative term, but, you know, so I don't know, what, I don't know what's going to happen, but as long as the Dolans do, I don't see it, but, um, okay, two more. We need a lady. <laughs> There she is. Okay, I got a question for you. <coughs> Amanda, how does it feel to be in the bathroom with each of us every morning? <laughs> how, how do you feel about that? Um, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> 
That's a great question. <laughs> well, um, I want to know. That's pretty great. I mean, why not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Amanda, but like when, when you hear something like that, or people say, <laughs> I listen to you when I get up, or you're, you drive with me to work, what do you think about that? I just think it's great. I mean, you know, that, that's the beauty of radio is that, you know, we are where you are. So wherever you are, that's where we can be. And I think, I think that's just awesome. So in your shower, fine. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Bring us in there. We'll, 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 come, we'll come Aren't on. there like electrical problems or things? Like, I guess the radio's on the outside. It's not getting all wet, right? Not my right. shower. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry, um, Believe it or not, Cleveland has more than three sports teams. So I wanted to ask a question not about any of the three we've talked about okay. tonight. What do you feel about the Monsters aligning with the Columbus Blue Jackets as opposed to being with Colorado Avalanche? Well, anytime you get a local farm team that's closer to where the major league teams, just like how the Indians um, you know, hooked up with Columbus, for example, right. I think that really helps. I have to admit I'm a hockey idiot. I just I'm just not very good. It's not I don't know much about it. I haven't done. We don't do hockey. It's sort of like I'm just not really no, good at it. No. But uh, hockey fans now. Tom Reed at the Plain Dealer covered the Blue Jackets for years. He loves hockey, huh. and I know that they feel that um, Dan Gilbert looked at one point about maybe an NHL team, but I think he felt between the Cavs and that they just couldn't sell enough there. But he's the one that's really poured a lot of money into the monsters and uh, to make it. Do you go? Do you go a lot? Or oh, yeah. yeah. What do they games. draw? What's their average attendance? Would you say? About eight thousand. Yeah, I mean, that's really good. It, it depends if it's T-shirt night or not. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. It's sort of like you know when the Indians don't know what to do. Let's have some fireworks. You know. That's, <laughs> I went to my dollar dogs. Yeah. Right. Of course. Yeah. I went to my first monsters game last. Uh, Last year, I That's loved right, it. That's right, you went. Yeah, yeah I, had a, I had a great time. And I'm not a hockey person either, but I had so much fun at that game. What was your favorite part of it? Um, the fights. You like the fights? <laughs> 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 it was we, we need one more question. We can't end on that. But Amanda <laughs> likes it when they fight. One last question, but first a word from our host. Okay. I just want to thank um, Terry and Amanda for coming tonight. Thank you for WKSU for helping us put this together. It was great. We will have a reception in the rotunda. Just head right back in the library. There will be um, refreshments, books for sale, and Terry, so you can have your book signed and meet Terry. So. And Amanda will be there too. You can't leave me. Okay. Oh, Amanda too, of course. Amanda will sign, probably <laughs> sign my name better than I would. She can, she can sign books too. Yeah, that's right. Okay, great. I, and I prefer to sign my own book. Once in a while, I've somebody else gives me like some other book that somebody wrote and I remember the last friend said well could at least be an author I heard of <laughs> like bring up John Grisham or something you know somebody's making some money here you know hey, last question. guess what we're gonna get you in they don't know that it's not the last question <laughs> go ahead yeah, Terry, uh, one name that doesn't seem to be showing up, in, at least in the Beacon Journal, is uh, the owner of the Cavs, or not the Cavs, the Browns. I mean, is he, uh, is he is laid back? Is he being uh, just staying out of the spotlight and letting his people do the work? Well, he's there, but yeah, he's staying out. I think, um, right, he's decided he's just not going to say anything. So I've requested interviews for him for the last two years and uh, haven't gotten anything. So, all right, one more. Right over here. This is it. Oh my goodness, it's a two part question. You're definitely the last question. <laughs> I'm just uh, wondering uh, do you, uh, you don't do that uh, sports discussion live, do you? You tape it maybe later in the day because newspaper reporters aren't known for being uh, up and out at 5 <laughs> <laughs> Tell the truth. The truth is we record it the day before. Oh, the day before? Mm -hmm. At 5.45 a.m.? No, 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 <laughs> not then, not then. But yeah, yeah, we recorded them They locked Tuesday us morning. in this room, and I have to, like, I'm not allowed out until I'm reasonably coherent. <laughs> Waterboring some, sometimes helps, but go ahead. The second one is, how can all this get started? In whose head did the light bulb go on? You know, you're busy doing morning edition, you're doing the local inserts, the weather, being alert in the studio there. Uh, did somebody call you in and say, hey, we're going to have a 
try and get a sports discussion show with uh, Terry Pluto up at the plane dealer. I'll tell. I'll, yeah, I think I, I have the whole story. Terry just knows I don't when, know he, anything. when he came in. But um, so we, I think it was in 2008 when the Cavs were in the playoffs and WKSU. We were trying to find. I was only I was only at the station one year at that point. I started there in 2007. And there was like, how are we going to cover the Cavs in the playoffs when they're on the road? Um, and what, what kind of approach are we going to take? And we came up with, well, let's call a sports commentator in, in, in the area. And we brainstormed, and of course, Terry's name came up, and it was like, Amanda, you know sports, call him. <laughs> okay, so I call him, and he says, who is this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, he wasn't like that, but he was kind of like, you know, wait, who, Pretty close. <laughs> Where are you from? Yeah. And he was very gracious, and he said, sure, I'll do some things. So we did some stuff on the phone while he was at the away games, and... Um, they kind of went very well, and so I kind of had a knowledge of sports, and we knew Terry was, was sounding really good on the air. And so um, the news director at the time, M.L. Schultz, he said, Amanda, what do you think about making this like a regular thing when the playoffs end? And we could do all different types of topics, and we could do a, a weekly thing. And I said, sure. Terry still didn't know who, who I was or what was going on. So when he showed up at the studio and we worked this all out, he was literally like, okay, so who are you? Yeah. And, you know, we just... It started working out, and uh, we've been doing it ever since, six years. So I don't remember a thing about doing this stuff from the playoffs. Yeah, it was. It was Of course, I don't remember breakfast. So <laughs> I remember so to come helped. tonight, though. That was good. Yeah, Roberta right. reminded me, so there. Yeah, so it just kind of morphed out of uh, phone calls, and then we decided let's, let's, let's cover sports this way. All right, Amanda, and you have uh, to go get a sign. What, the thank I do? You sign. Oh, I have to get the sign? Oh, yes. okay. All right, I'll get the sign. Uh, and we've just, as you could tell, I mean, she's she, Amanda. Amanda's special to us. All right, here we go. <laughs> what does it say, Amanda? It says, "Thank God for readers and listeners." And that's what we really mean. Now. <laughs> so we thank you for that. As Amanda and I talk about, because without you, there's no us. And if there's no you. We got to go get a job. We don't want to think about it. So don't go anywhere. All right, Polly. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, WKSU, for putting this on. We really appreciate it. We'll see all of you in the rotunda. All right. Thanks to the management and staff of the Hudson Library and Historical Society for their assistance in the production of this program and for providing the adult program series for the citizens of Hudson. For a DVD or Blu-ray copy of this or any HCTV program, contact Hudson Cable Television at 330-653-2500 or via email at hctv at hudson.oh.us.